this is a tough act to follow. Um, you can't, can't follow it. So we're in our own world, the world of movies. Um, and it's a pleasure to be here. And uh, ironically, we're not in Hollywood. You know, we work in Marin, and uh, you know, or, or around the world. You know, John and I do, or around the world. So, uh, but I guess a lot of the money comes from Hollywood. So that's why we're, that's why it's we're looped into, into that group. But I just want to talk a little bit about uh, the process, the problems that we have for Hollywood and or for films, and being able to make a leap to the work that David Hockney does, or that sort of you know immersive. Uh, filmmaking, and not that I have an answer or any of us do. That's what the panel is going to be sort of talking about a little bit afterwards. But just to sort of give you a little background of it and about my own sort of story about how I got interested in this, and uh, a lot of the stuff that David's talked about in his books and, and the uh, interviews with him, you know, I guess a lot of artists go through the same thing, this sense of discovery and wanting to see deeply into things and in order to sort of understand it. And that's, I want to give some examples sort of about you know, what an effects person kind of needs to do to do that. So let me just start here with, uh, with something that um, has been frowned upon in here, which is sort of the is Cyclops view of things, the single eye view of things. And yet, this is where film and our observation began essentially with, and this is from uh, George Millet's uh, Trip to the Moon, and all this whole stuff works, of course, with one view. And this was, all these are like stage sets or built by stage people. Um, that's all that we kind of had when photography started out and when movies started had. So they were, everything kind of had to be told in this. And, they, and Cuddy was frowned upon because it was kind of freaky for the audience and everything. So you've got the moon, you've got the girl on the, on uh, something or other. I don't know, I guess she's a, it's a swing that also looks like a moon, but who knows what. But it's really a two-dimensional two-dimensional uh, view we're seeing of but something that practically looks two-dimensional in the, in the screen at all. Uh, I mean, when you saw it in person, it looked pretty flat. So when I was a kid, I got really interested in effects from a very young age for some reason. And the sort of Cyclops view of things totally made what I was doing work. It wouldn't have worked if it had been a, you know, an immersive view. And I, this is an example of a, a film I shot, just home movies when I was a kid. And they, this is forced perspective stuff. I was trying to do this giant and this regular sized person. And this, uh, this effect only works because you're seeing it with one eye. Because you've got a person in the foreground, and then I've got his brother, you know, 40 feet away in the background. And the camera is just one eye, right? There's no perspective or anything on it. And if you, you know, you sort of squint and you kind of look and you get the film back, and it's, my god, you've got a giant creature there. And it really works. And this is what film is really based on, is this limitation at the moment. It's, it's this limitation in it that, um, that was so valuable to me. <laughs> and this is all, this is way back in the days of 8 millimeter, before Super 8 or anything like that. And, and people, you know, you can shoot this stuff yourself with your cell phone now. This is actually a hand coming over a mirror, is how that bit was on. And I also did stop motion animation, too, single frame at a time. Uh, puppets made of rubber with wire inside of them, stuff like that. So I was just experimenting from the time I was, you know, like nine or ten to learn about how these processes were done. And I saw them when I was a kid, you know, in the movie theaters and on TV. So I shot hours and hours and hours of stop motion stuff and things like this. And that's a tiny little bit of it. And essentially, the movies today, you know, some of your, the, the, memorable scenes that will be with us forever are, when you think about what they are, they are this like Cyclops point of view, but within them is just an incredible amount of talented people coming together to make those iconic images. Some of them are lucky they came together, most of them are not lucky. They're the result of people, you know, experts in every single profession coming together between lighting and makeup and acting and set design and, and camera placement and everything to come up with these things that, you know, that are just with us forever. So I think part of the process of, of hitting this level of, uh, of filmmaking is to study the real world, because we've got to come up with new things all the time that are going to make the world interesting, or make you know, the films interesting to us. And there's just so many things you can do in the 2D world um, that I'm doing effects, because a lot of the stuff I do are, is artificial that never existed. <clears throat> a lot of ideas can come from things that you see in the real world. So all the time, I'm, I've just got this massive library of you know, thousands and thousands of photos that I just, I, if I ever see them on the web, I just grab them, take pictures of them, I study them, I try to figure out the relationships 
you know, here's an example of a real fight. Why does it look real? Why doesn't it look like a special effect? Why doesn't it look like two scenes put together, you know? But it isn't because it's real. But then why does it look real, you know? And anything that's just got sort of a, you know, a, a mystery to it, like this shot does, it's just really, I don't even know who shot, you know, who shoots a lot of these things, but I just grab them. If it just sort of gets my attention, I'll, uh, you know, I'll, I'll, like I said, I'll pull off the web and I just sort of cycle through these every so often. And for no reason except to, no single reason, but to build up sort of a feeling of what I like. And if I like something a lot, I'll really try to understand it, you know, to really see what, maybe what's going on. And try to figure it out, like this one. This is uh, Lillian Bassman, who was a photographer for Vogue, shot this years ago. Uh, she used a specific model who had a very long neck who she just loved. And if you look at the posing, the angles that are going on are just great. And it's not nearly as um, accidental as it looks. There's a, at least two wires holding her wardrobe out, maybe three of them. And they're holding her wardrobe out so that they can get the, uh, you know, so he, she can get this photo, right? I think it was actually done in downtown in New York somewhere. And then there's a lot of artwork going on around the edge sort of distortion and stuff like that when the print is made to be able to, uh, you know, make the focus on her. And the pose on her, if you look at that, is just really remarkable, too, which she's got. So in, in my study of this stuff, one of the things I also do, of course, is study artwork. And I'm a big fan of John Singer Sargent's. And uh, I even, if this is going to run here, I went and visited, I tried to visit places where people shot their stuff, and this is a, or, or painted their paintings or whatever it is. And, we found this alleyway in, uh, in Venice that, that uh, Sargent had done this painting on the bottom there. That was, and it's always neat. I just really enjoy going to those places. I feel I can kind of see how they change things, you know, what time has done to things, and uh, try to figure out maybe what it was that went on there at the time to, you know, to inspire the person to do it. I don't know. Um, and in, in the research that, that it's, I wouldn't even call it research, but part of this, you can actually, of course, apply these to the work you do sometime. And I found all this real, really interesting photograph stuff, and then we managed to use this idea when we did uh, a scene in War of the Worlds. It was done a few years ago uh, with Tom Cruise, and I'll show you that in a moment. Because from this work, you could learn how things are constructed and then how they will be deconstructed. And a lot of the work we do shows you know things blowing up or something like that or falling over but they want to look real they don't want to like suddenly look like they're some fanciful thing you never want to trust your memory on any of this stuff i learned that a long time ago so from this we can learn something even though it's a wild and crazy thing we can learn how things might break apart if they were hit by these marching rays so here's uh here's what that looked like in the film And of course, uh, what you're seeing in there was actually shot in, uh, in New Jersey uh, in a totally safe area. And then we added all those effects. But to make them look accurate, you know, I had an idea about how this bridge should actually bro uh, blow apart, you know, based on how it was constructed, how a tanker truck would fall and blow up. It's not just like, oh, let's have this thing fall. You've got to look at, you know, perspectives and lighting and, and drama and timing, because we deal in, in, in timing, of course, on it to be able to put those things together, uh, to get something that when you see it, it just seems like, ooh, this is, uh, I'm seeing a real thing. Because we live in the real world, and you can really tell right away if something isn't real. Not that you just want to copy reality. You don't ever want to do that. You want to give it a punch so it's, you know, like a really special thing. But you do want it, in my opinion, you want it to look like it was done with real photography, if, if that's the style of the movie. So uh, in addition to sort of studying artwork, I, I try to figure out, like in this case with uh, Norman Rockwell, what is the difference between his reference photos and his painting? And I just have never, it took me a long time to think, what the heck is going on? These photos are not nearly as interesting as his paintings. And so I did this little study here and realized that he's changed the, the shape of the characters, uh, made the guy, the policeman, look bulkier and more heroic and changed his pose as he's sitting on the table. The kid is a little more leaned over, like a little more intimidated or, or bonded to the policeman already. Just thing after thing. So it's not like just taking photographs and tracing them. It's interpreting them in such a way that 
that makes it, um, I don't know, at least to me, I really, I really emotionally respond to things that seem like perfect, and his work is very, very perfect. Here's an example of the other side. This is a, uh, a Frazetta, and also I think the guy's name is Vallejo, Boris Vallejo. Uh, Boris works pretty much from photographs. Frazetta kind of does, but just changes them all over the place, you know? And I just respond strongly to the, cha the altered artwork that, that has got a, a very strong style to it, and it's focused on what he wants you to see and what's, you know, what he doesn't want you to see and stuff like that. These are all choices that the artist, of course, makes. Um, and part of my studying into this, I was about, about three weeks ago, I was in Boston and had a little time and went to the Garner Museum and stopped by and saw this, uh, which is like about eight feet wide or something like that, and, and I'd seen it a couple of times before. And I had some time and I just sat down on a bench and started looking at it, and I was saying, okay, um, what can I see that I haven't seen before? And I was there for an hour, and I got out my iPhone, and I wrote this, all this down, and I just was amazed at what he had done to make that artwork you know, amazing, which is about a subject that I had really no interest in. Spanish dancing, uh, you know, I don't know. It wasn't, didn't really grab me. But I saw this, and there was just something so compelling about it. So I started looking into it and say, okay, he's got the figure on the left going off to the side. That's not the way you'd compose that shot. You would compose it with the figure, I mean, the figure's on the right. You'd compose it with the figure going into the shot. So the figure should have been really on the left looking in, something like this. Uh, not with the figure over on the other side. Well, this is one of Sargent's early sketches for it. He had started out with that line of thinking. And then he, he, of course, worked on it, worked on it, and decided to get the dramatic lighting into it. And by this point, he was still having the figure on that side, something very familiar. But to me, this looks like the, the performance is over. It's like, that's it. But, and then when you look at the real thing, you're in the middle of it because she's off to the side. So you know she's got to turn around and come back into the frame. It's just amazing, you know? And then the darkness of this, too, really makes it real moody, and it's sort of like what I call peekaboo. Some people call it uh, find and lose, lose and find. And, uh, you know, it was just uh, it was amazing seeing this in person and being able to walk up to it, you know, and just really sort of study it. Now I have to figure out some way to buy it, but I don't have that figured out yet. <laughs> So then I, uh, I worked on Jurassic, and an example of, of something like this that's lost and found for Jurassic Park is when the T-Rex in the main storm comes out of the rain, and you can barely see it when you first see it. It's got about to walk out here. This was not the intention in the film to have this be this invisible. The, it didn't really matter, you know, Stephen didn't really care, uh, just as long as it walks out and sort of roars, and that was kind of the idea. But the idea, because films work in, in a time frame, you don't get to stop and look at them, uh, I try to have a shot become an evolving shot. So it starts one, where, one place, it'll end somewhere else, so you've been interested as the shot is progressing. And this, a way to do this was to bury this in the darkness, in the rain and just in darkness. And as it walks forward, you start to see it. And you see it a little bit more and then you see it a little bit more. And by the time you get to really see it here, it's more visible. It's come out of the haze, and there it is. And that's just a, that, that's one of the tricks that, that we need to use because we work in this sort of cyclops view of things, and we can't really add any more than these sort of artistic tricks. Um, now, I want to show something that John Gator did, who's here with me, who works also in Island. He worked at the Matrix, on the Matrix. And this is an example of where actually time was kind of shifted. In my opinion, it's one of the neatest breakthrough shots that was ever done. It took me a while to figure out why, because it's, it appears like it's a slow motion shot, but it really isn't. It's way beyond a slow motion shot. And uh, what they're trying to do here, I don't know, I, I haven't asked John if this is on purpose or not, but it's, it's, a, it's what they call bullet time, and these bullets are flying by Keona Reeves, but the time is all shifted. The, if you were actually shooting with a real camera, the bullet would probably, or the camera would be going to shoot the bullets three or four thousand frames a second. But on Keona Reeves, it's probably, I don't know, a hundred frames a second or two hundred frames. So it's completely broken the rules of time within the shot. And I tell you, if we'd had a meeting and discussed this, everybody would have said, that'll never work because you've broken these rules. Well, there are no rules, you know, and, and this shot, and these shots that were in this film really started something brand new that has not really taken off, and I kind of hoped it would. But here's a, uh, that sequence, or that, that shot. Trinity! Help! And 
then it goes back into real time at the end. So I just thought, you know, I, I, I didn't know what it was. I'd seen the slow motion stuff before. A lot of this had been done about six months before in commercials that didn't nearly have the effect that this does. The moving, but if you look at this, the moving camera is moving like a real, at real camera speed. He's moving about a quarter normal speed. The, the bullet's moving at a thousandth normal speed or something like that. And what a breakthrough in, in conceptual thinking. And you love it. You don't object to it. You don't criticize it when you see the movie. You just love it. And uh, again, I, that hasn't really taken off. I hope that's someplace maybe, you know, that the audiences, I, I think they are becoming more familiar with this sort of stuff and more aware of things and maybe can take it in. So another thing regarding time, there was a movie made similar to what one of the guys earlier talked about uh, called Time Code. And I just have a terrible copy of this here. That was all, it was a feature film. Uh, and it was shot with four cameras, all shot in LA, all scenes going on exactly at the same time. So, and then they all do come together near the end of the film. And I think he shot it nine times over a period of whatever it was, an hour and a half, uh, to make the entire film. And it's, it, you know, I, saw, I tried to watch it, I couldn't get through it, and other people have said the same thing. Be, and it's just like there's maybe too much information. But the nice thing is on the DVD of it, you can like listen to your own audio channel. So you can go down there, I want to hear what, what happened here and listen to just that channel or that guy over there, you know. But I thought it was a great idea and a really neat experiment. And, but maybe the fact that, that time is going by and you have four things you're trying to look at and it's moving forward and you can't stop and think about the things makes it too hard to look at, I don't know. But maybe someone else will try this also someday. Uh, you know, and so one of the things that, another thing that Hollywood is doing that is more successful at trying to uh, be more immersive or whatever are large theater screens. And this is one that was put in Sydney, Australia recently. It's the biggest, supposedly the biggest screen in the world, which is about 130 feet wide or something like that. Just massive. And this is one in Tokyo, or no, in Korea, which is over 100 feet. And you know, these just bring you into the movie more. Anytime you've got something you know, big like that, it's, uh, it sort of sucks you into it. And I think the reason this is happening, and I did this as a, originally as a joke, but I think there's actually some truth to it, is that bigger actors need bigger screens. And I think the audience responds to that. And as long as we have these big old Transformer Pacific Rim movies in here, heck, there's nothing wrong with going and seeing something almost full size there, you know, because it's just really neat to look at. So anyway, that's, uh, that's it. I hope that was, uh, that'll now begin the, uh, inter the, or the discussion where we will solve how we're going to bring Hollywood into the 21st century. Thanks. Thanks.